Hello class, this is Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Injured, Chapter 8, Lifting and Moving Patients. When you complete this chapter and the related coursework, you will understand the body mechanics of patient movement, principles of safe reaching and pulling, urgent and non-urgent moves, how to move patients as a team, types of patient packaging and moving equipment, and how to protect both the EMT and the patient from injury when moving patients, and the use of medical restraints. In the course of a call, you'll have to move patients several times to provide emergency medical care and transport. Once you've assessed the patient and provided emergency care, you and your team may have to move the patient onto a backboard or stretcher. At a minimum, you will have to lift and carry the patient to the stretcher, move the stretcher to the ambulance, and load the stretcher into the patient compartment. Upon arrival at the hospital, the patient must be removed from the ambulance, wheeled into the emergency department, and transfer to an ED bed. To move patients without injury to the patient, yourself, or your team, you need to learn how to lift and carry a patient properly. Knowledge of proper body mechanics and power grip is important. Lifting and carrying are dynamic processes. In order to avoid unexpected, dangerous shifts in weight and to reduce the risk of injury to yourself, your partner, and the patient, you and your team should practice these techniques often. The wheeled ambulance stretcher or ambulance stretcher or gurney is the device most commonly used to move and transport patients. The wheeled stretcher generally weighs 40 to 145 pounds depending on its design and features. It's generally not taken up or down stairs or to other locations where the patient must be carried for any significant distance. Moving a patient by rolling, using a stretcher, or other wheeled device is preferred when the situation allows and helps prevent injuries from carrying. Modern stretchers are available in a number of models, so before going on a call, familiarize yourself with the specific features of a stretcher that your ambulance carries. There are general features of stretchers. Most have the specific head and specific foot ends. They have strong rectangular tubular metal frames to which all other parts are attached. The stretcher is pulled, pushed, or lifted by the main frame or its handles. Most models have a second tubular frame made up of three sections that's attached to within or above the main frame. A metal plate is fastened to each of these three sections between its sides and serves as the platform on which the stretcher mattress and patient are supported. The head section of the stretcher runs from the head end to near the center where the patient's hips will be. Hinges at the center allow the head end to be elevated and the patient's back be positioned at any desired angle. Retractable gargoyles are attached along the central portion of the frame and can be lowered when a patient is being loaded onto or out of a stretcher. When they're up, they prevent the patient from rolling off the stretcher. The undercarriage frame allows the litter to be adjusted to any height and locked into place from 12 inches above the ground for when the stretcher is secured within the ambulance to 32 to 36 inches above the ground for when the stretcher is being rolled. The mattress on a stretcher must be fluid resistant so it does not absorb any type of potentially infectious material including water, blood, or other body fluid. Patients must always be secured with straps on the stretcher. In the event of a crash while en route to the hospital, the straps help safeguard the patient from further injury. Backboards are long, flat boards made of rigid, rectangular material. Most of the time, they're plastic. They're used to carry and immobilize spinal patients with suspected hip, pelvic, spinal, and lower extremity injuries or other multiple traumas. They're commonly used for patients who are found lying down. Parallel to the sides and ends of the board are long holes that serve as handles and that allow straps to be used to secure the patient to the board. If your service uses wooden backboards, you must follow infection control procedures before you can reuse them. Never back, newer backboards are made of lighter plastic materials that will not absorb blood or other infectious diseases. When you move a patient, take care that injury does not occur to you, to your team, 
or to the patient. Patient lifting and moving are technical skills that require repeated training and practice. Many EMTs are injured while lifting and moving patients. Using proper body mechanics and maintaining physical fitness greatly reduce the chance of injury. You must master the skills necessary for the use of all equipment and understand the advantages and limitations of each device before you use it in the field. Let's do a quick anatomy review. The shoulder girdle rests on the rib cage and is supported by the vertebrae. The arms are connected to and hang from the shoulder girdle. When standing upright, the vertebrae are stacked on top of each other and aligned over the sacrum. The sacrum is both the mechanical weight-bearing base of the spinal column and the fused central posterior section of the pelvic girdle. Body mechanics is the relationship between the body's anatomic structures and the physical forces associated with lifting, moving, and carrying. Maintaining proper body posture and body movement during daily activities is applying the use of good body mechanics. Using good body mechanics while lifting and moving patients reduces your risk of injury. When standing upright, the weight of anything being lifted and carried in the hands is reflected onto the shoulder girdle, the spinal column, the pelvis, and then the legs. Let's talk about lifting position. The shoulder girdle should be aligned over the pelvis. The hands should be held close to the legs. Force then essentially goes straight down the spinal column and very little strain occurs. This is an example of the correct way to lift. You may injure your back if you lift while you're leaning forward or if you lift with your back straight but bent forward at the hips. This is an incorrect method of lifting. Legs should be spread about 15 inches apart, which is shoulder width. Place feet so that your center of gravity is properly balanced. With your back held upright, bring your upper body down by bending the legs. Grasp the patient on the stretcher and make any necessary adjustments in the location of your feet. Lift the patient by raising your upper body and arms and straightening your legs until you're in a standing position and then curling your arms up to waist height. Lifting by extending the properly placed flex legs is the safest and most powerful way to lift and is called the power lift and it is a skill practice you will have in class. Hold your arms so your hands are almost adjacent to the plane as described by your anterior torso and keep the weight until that you are lifting as close to your body as possible. Keep your arms the same distance apart as when you're hanging your arms at each side of your body. When directly lifting a patient, tightly grip the patient in a place and manner that will ensure you will not lose your grasp on the patient. The same body mechanics and principles apply to moving, lifting, and carrying a patient. In relation to the body drag, you want to keep your back locked in a tight curve created by tightening your abdominal muscles. Kneel to minimize the distance that you will have to lean over. Extend your arms no more than 15 to 20 inches in front of you when you can pull no further because your hands have reached the front of your torso, stop and move back another 15 or 20 inches. Alternate between pulling the patient by slowly flexing your arms and repositioning yourself. Here are some examples of principles of safe reaching and pulling. If you have to drag a patient across a bed, Kneel on the bed to avoid reaching beyond the recommended distance. Drag the patient within 15 to 20 inches. Complete the drag while standing on the side of the bed. Use the sheet or blanket under the patient rather than dragging the patient by his or her clothing. In the hospital, transfer the patient from the stretcher to a bed with a body drag. The stretcher should be the same height or slightly higher than the bed. You and a partner should kneel on the bed and drag in increments.
This is the example of log rolling a patient onto his or her side to place the patient on a backboard. When log rolling a patient onto his or her side, kneel as close to the patient's side as possible. When you lean forward, keep your back straight and lean solely from the hips. Roll the patient without stopping until the patient is resting on his or her side and braced against your thighs. Pulling towards you allows your legs to prevent the patient from rolling over completely and from rolling beyond the intended distance. Principles of safe lifting and carrying. Whenever possible, use a device that can be rolled. When a wheeled device is not available, make sure you understand and follow the proper guidelines for carrying a patient on a stretcher. With patient weight, you need to estimate the patient's weight before lifting. Adults often weigh between 120 and 220 pounds. Two EMTs should be able to safely lift this weight. Try to use four providers to lift when possible. It gives you more stability and requires less strength. Do not attempt to lift a patient who weighs more than 250 pounds with fewer than four providers. Know the weight limitations of the equipment and how to handle patients who exceed the weight limitations. Let's talk now about lifting and carrying a patient on a backboard or stretcher. More of the patient's weight rests on the head half of the device than on the foot half. The diamond carry uses one EMT at the head and one at the foot of the backboard and one on each side of the torso. This is also a skill you'll be practicing in class. This is an example of a diamond carry right here. When the stretcher must be carried, it is best if four providers are available to carry it. One provider should be positioned at each corner of the stretcher to provide an even lift. When you're rolling the wheeled ambulance stretcher, Make sure it is in the fully elevated position. Your partner should control the head and assist you by pushing it with his or her arms held with the elbows bent. Moving a patient with a stair chair. You want to use a stair chair to carry a patient up or down a flight of stairs or other significant incline if the patient is conscious and the patient's condition allows him or her to be placed in the sitting position. A stair chair is a lightweight folding chair with a molded seat, adjustable safety straps, and fold out handles at both the head and feet. Most models have rubber wheels in the back with casters in the front so they can be rolled along the floor and make turns. Some have a specifically designed track to facilitate movement down steps with little lifting required. When moving with patients on a stretcher, a backboard should be used for a patient who is unresponsive, who must be moved in a supine position, and who must be immobilized. Went to carry the patient on the backboard down the stairs to the prepared stretcher. Place the strongest EMTs at the head and foot ends of the board. The taller person should be at the foot end. Once you reach the stretcher, place both the backboard and the patient on the stretcher. Secure both to the stretcher with additional straps. To carry a patient on stairs on a backboard, you're going to want to follow the steps in skill drill 8-5, which you will also practice in class. Loading a wheeled stretcher into an ambulance. Ensure the frame is held firmly between two hands so it does not tip. Newer models are self-loading. Newer models are self-loading and extra wheels at the head end of the stretcher allow you to push the stretcher into the back of the ambulance. Models that are not self-loading need to be lowered and then lifted to the height of the floor of the ambulance. Clamps in the ambulance will hold the stretcher in place during transport. You'll follow the skips in skill 35-6 to load a stretcher onto an ambulance. And again, you'll practice that in class. Now let's talk about directions and commands. Team actions must be coordinated. There should be a team leader, and this indicates where each team member should be and rapidly describes the sequence of steps to perform before lifting. 
preparatory commands are used. For example, the team leader says, all ready to stop to get the team's attention, identify who should act, and prepare the team to act. The team leader says, stop, in a louder voice to indicate the exact moment of execution. Countdowns are often used to lift a patient. Example, one, two, three. Always clarify if three is part of the preparatory command or whether it is to serve as the order to execute. You want to carefully plan ahead. Select the methods that will involve the least amount of lifting and carrying. Always consider whether there's an option that will cause less strain to you and other EMTs. Now we're going to discuss emergency moves. Emergency moves are used when there's a potential for danger before assessment and care are provided. For example, fire, explosives, or hazardous materials. These are used these types of moves are used when you cannot properly assess the patient or provide immediate care because of the patient's location or position. If you are alone, use a drag pull to pull the patient along the long axis of the body. Use techniques to prevent aggravation of the patient's spinal injury, potential spinal injury, if present. First is the clothes drag, when you pull on the patient's clothing in the neck and shoulder area or a blanket drag where you place the patient on a blanket coat or other item that can be pulled. An arm drag is where you rotate the patient's arms so they're extended straight on the ground beyond his or her head, grasp their wrists, and drag the patient. The arm to arm drag is where you place your arms under the patient's shoulder and through the armpits and while grasping your opposite wrist, drag the patient backwards. These are examples of the pulls I just discussed. To remove an unconscious patient from a vehicle alone, you want to move the patient's legs clear of the pedals, rotate the patient so that his or her back is toward the open car door. Place your arms through the armpits and support the head against your body and drag the patient from the seat to a safe location. If the legs and feet do not clear the car, lower the patient to the ground until the patient is, his on, is on his or her back, clear the legs from the vehicle, and drag the patient to a safe location. This is an example of how to remove a person from a car if you're a single rescuer. Now let's discuss urgent moves. An urgent move may be necessary to move a patient with an altered level of consciousness, with inadequate ventilation, who's in shock, or in extreme weather conditions. Rapid extrication techniques should be used when a patient is sitting in a vehicle and must be urgently moved. And this is a skill drill that you will practice. Whether a backboard is used for this skill will depend on your local protocols. This rapid extrication technique should only be used if urgency exists, such as the vehicle or scene is unsafe, if there are explosives or other hazards that are on scene, if there's fire or danger of fire, if the patient cannot be properly assessed prior to removal from the vehicle, if the patient needs immediate intervention that requires a supine position, if the patient has a life-threatening condition requiring immediate transport, or if the patient blocks your access to another seriously injured patient. Proper placement of a mobilization device is usually requires six to eight minutes. Using the rapid extrication technique, a patient can be moved from sitting into a vehicle to supine on a backboard in one minute or less. Because of its rapid nature, this te inc technique increases the risk of damage if the patient has a spinal injury. So look at all available options before using this technique. You should not use this technique if no urgency exists. It does require a team of three providers who are knowledgeable and practiced in the procedure. Once the patient's been moved from the backboard, move moved onto the backboard, move the patient away from the hazard to begin life-saving treatment. Now we'll discuss non-urgent moves. Non-urgent moves are used when both the scene and the patient are stable. Carefully plan how to move the patient. The team leader should plan the move and there should be enough providers, obstacles that are identified and removed, proper equipment available, and the procedure and path are to be followed and identified. The methods for lifting and carrying are you going to choose 
between a direct ground lift, which we'll discuss now, and a direct ground lift is used for patients with no suspected spinal injury who are found supine on the ground. Use the direct ground lift when the patient will be need to, needed to carry a distance to the stretcher. And the EMTs stand side by side to lift and carry the patient. Ideally, it should be formed by three EMTs, but it can be done with two. So you're going to choose between a direct ground lift or the following. The extremity lift. The extremity lift is used for patients with no suspected extremity or spinal injury who are in a supine or sitting position. It may be helpful when the patient is in a small space because it does not require EMTs to stand side by side. One EMT is positioned at the patient's head. The other EMT is positioned at the patient's feet. Coordinate your movements using direct verbal commands. Then there are transfer moves. These are the direct carry. With two or more rescuers, you can move the supine patient from the bed to the stretcher using a direct carry method. And this is a skill you'll practice. You can use the draw sheet method where you place with two or more rescuers, you move the patient from a bed to a stretcher using a sheet or blanket. Place the stretcher next to the bed, making sure it's the same height or slightly lower. The rails are lowered and the straps are unbuckled. Hold or secure the stretcher to keep it from moving. Loosen the bottom sheet underneath the patient or log roll the patient onto a blanket. Reach across the stretcher and grasp the sheet or blanket firmly at the patient's head, chest, chest hips, and knees. Then gently glide the patient onto the stretcher. Center the patient on the sheet and tightly roll up the excess fabric on each side. This produces a cylindrical handle that provides a strong, secure way to grasp the fabric. When using a scoop stretcher, you insert the halves of the scoop stretcher under each side of the patient. Fasten the sides together. With two or more rescuers, you move the patient to a nearby stretcher. Some other carries are when you place a backboard next to a patient, log roll or slide to move the patient onto the backboard, secure the patient, and lift and carry the backboard to the nearby prepared stretcher. Assist the patient to the edge of the bed and place the patient's leg over the side, helping the patient to sit up. Move the stretcher so that its foot end touches the bed near the patient. Help the patient to stand and rotate so that he or she can sit down or on the center of the stretcher. Lift the patient's legs and rotate them onto the stretcher while your partner lowers the patient's torso onto the stretcher. If the patient is in a chair and cannot assist you, transfer the patient from a chair to a stair chair. Now we'll talk about geriatrics. Most patients transported by EMS are geriatric patients. There are skeletal changes in older people that may cause brittle bones, rigidity, and spinal curvatures. These present special challenges in packaging and moving older patients. Many patients cannot lie supine on a backboard or scoop stretcher without causing further injury. Consider geriatric specific immobilization devices such as vacuum mattress. Consult your local protocols. For many older patients, the fear of illness and disability is ever present. An emergency trip to the hospital can be a terrifying and disorienting experience. The possibility of never returning home is a real fear for many of these patients. So allay the patient's fears with a sympathetic and compassionate approach. Slow down, explain, and anticipate. Here are a couple of skeletal changes you might find in geriatric patients. Kyphosis and spondylosis. Now let's talk about bariatrics. Approximately 76 million adults in the United States are obese. 40% are adults aged 40 to 59, 30% of adults aged 20 to 39, 35% of adults aged 61 or older, and 70% of children. With bariatrics, the management or prevention and control of obesity and allied diseases is the definition of bariatrics. Back injuries account for the largest number of missed days or work. So in dealing with a bariatric patient, you have to be really careful. The larger the patient, the more likely he or she will need emergency medical treatment and transportation. Bariatric patients are taking an increasing toll on the health of EMTs and back injuries account for the largest number of missed days of work. So stretchers and equipment are being produced with ever higher capacities. 
Increased capacity, however, does not address the dangers to users of that equipment. Mechanical ambulance lifts are used in Europe, but are uncommon in the United States. Bariatric stretchers are specialized wheel stretcher for overweight or obese patients. It has a wider patient surface area and a wider wheelbase for increased stability. Some are equipped with optional features such as a tow package, which allows for an ambulance mounted winch to assist in loading the patient into the ambulance, or telescoping side lifting handles, which allow for increased leverage when lifting with multiple providers. Their most important feature is the increased weight lifting capacity. Typical stretchers are weighted to a maximum, rated to a maximum weight of 650 pounds, but a bariatric stretcher is rated to hold 850 to 900 pounds. There are pneumatic and electronic powered wheeled stretchers. These are battery operated with electronic controls to raise and lower the undercarriage. The added controls and equipment increase the weight of the stretcher. This can create a potential hazard when transporting a patient on uneven terrain or up and down steps. These are stretchers with a strong rectangular tubular metal frame with rigid fabric stretched across it. Some models, it does not have a second frame or an adjustable undercarriage. Some models do have two wheels that make it easier to move the loaded stretcher. And some models can be folded in half for storage. These are used in areas that are difficult to reach or when a second patient must be transported on the squad bench. They weigh much less than wheeled stretchers. Because most models do not have wheels, your team must support all the patient's weight, equipment, and the stretcher itself. Then there are flexible stretchers. These can be rolled up across the stretcher's width or length so the stretcher becomes a small tubular package. They're excellent for storage and carrying and can form around a patient's side and do not extend beyond them. When extended, it's useful for removing a patient from or through a confined space. Certain flexible stretchers can be belayed or repelled by ropes. It is the most uncomfortable stretcher, but it provides excellent support and immobilization. Then there are short backboards. These are used to immobilize the head, torso, and neck of a seated patient with a suspected spinal injury until the patient can be removed to a long backboard. It's approximately three to feet long, three to four feet long, and short wooden backboards exist, and they have mostly been replaced with a vest type device such as the KED or KED, which is designed to immobilize the patient until he or she is moved from a sitting position to a supine position on a backboard. The vacuum mattress is an alternative to the backboard for immobilizing geriatric and pediatric patients. The patient is placed on the mattress and the air is removed from the device, allowing it to mold around the patient. It provides a high degree of immobilization, comfort, and thermal insulation. Then there is the basket stretcher, which is a rigid stretcher. It's also called a Stokes litter. It's used to carry a patient across uneven terrain from a remote location that is inaccessible by ambulance or other vehicle. It is used for technical rope rescues and some water rescues. If the patient has a suspected spinal injury, secure the patient to a backboard and place the backboard inside the basket stretcher. When you return to the ambulance, lift the backboard out of the basket stretcher and place it on the wheeled ambulance stretcher. Basket stretchers are made of plastic with an aluminum frame or have a full steel frame that is connected by a woven wire mesh. Their design allows water to drain through the stretcher. Then there's a scoop stretcher, which is also called an orthopedic stretcher. It's designed to be split into two or four pieces. The pieces are fitted around a patient who's lying on the ground or on a flat surface. The parts are then reconnected and the patient is lifted and put onto a backboard. Both sides of the patient must be accessible to use a scoop stretcher. You must fully immobilize and secure the patient on the scoop stretcher. There is a neonatal isolate. A neonatal patient cannot be transported on a wheeled ambulance stretcher. A neonatal isolate is sometimes referred to as an incubator. It keeps the neonatal patient warm with warm, moistened air in a clean environment and protects from noise, drafts, infection, and excessive handling. The isolate can be placed directly on a wheeled ambulance stretcher and secured with seat belts. 
freestanding and secured into the back of an ambulance in place of where the free stretcher can be is also another option. Now let's discuss decontamination. It is essential that you decontaminate equipment after you use it for your own safety, for the safety of the crew using the equipment after you, for the safety of your patients, to prevent the spread of disease, so know and follow your local standard operating procedures for disinfecting equipment. Now let's discuss patient positioning. A patient must be properly positioned based on chief complaint. Certain patient conditions such as head injury, shock, spinal injury, pregnancy, and obese patients call for special lifting and moving techniques. A patient with no suspected injury who's reporting chest pain or respiratory distress should be placed in a position of comfort, typically a Fowler or semi Fowler's position. Patients who are in shock should be packaged and placed in the supine position. Patients who are in late stages of pregnancy should be positioned and transported on their left side if they are uncomfortable or if they're hypotensive when supine. An unresponsive patient with no suspected spinal hip or pelvic injury should be placed in the recovery position. A patient who's nauseated or vomiting should be transported in a position of comfort. Obese patients should be positioned in the same as other patients with a similar condition. Ensure that their dignity is maintained. In terms of medical restraints, which we're going to discuss now, you want to first evaluate the patient for correctable causes of combativeness. These include head injury, hypoxia, and hypoglycemia. Follow local protocols. Obtain medical control authorization if necessary. There may be consequences for either applying the restraints or failing to restrain a patient who should have been restrained. If the patient poses a danger to you, or your team members, himself or herself, or bystanders, the application of physical strengths needs to be considered. Before you take action to restrain the patient, attempt to speak to the patient in a calming manner and de-escalate the situation. The restraints require a minimum of five personnel, one for each extremity of the patient and one for his or her head. One EMT should be the established team leader, so develop a plan to restrain the patient together. A patient who's caught off guard is less likely to cause injury to the responders. The patient should be in the supine position. A patient in the prone position can develop positional asphyxia. You want to apply a restraint to each extremity and the patient should be restrained on a backboard with one arm above his or her head and the other by his or her side. Assess the patient's ABCs, mental status, and distal circulation after restraints are applied and make sure to document all information. Now there are personal considerations or personnel considerations. So ask yourself before moving a patient, am I physically strong enough to lift or move this patient? Is there adequate room to get the proper stance to lift the patient? Do I need additional personnel for lifting assistance? Injured EMTs are no help to anyone, so make sure that you get all the help and support that you need. Thank you for your time and attention, and we're going to go over some review questions now. Review question one. What is the first rule of lifting? Twist slowly when you lift. B, keep your back in a straight position. C, bend at the waist to pick something up, or D, use your arms to do most of the lifting. This one should be pretty obvious. And it is B, which is the first rule of lifting, which is to always keep your back in a straight, upright position and use the powerful muscles of your thighs. Never twist while lifting. So let's look at the incorrect answers. We just talked about this. Twist slowly when you lift. You should never twist your back. B, keep your back in a straight position, which is the correct answer. C, bend at the waist to pick something up. You should never bend at the waist. Your back should be properly maintained in an upright position. Or use your arms to do most of the lifting, and that's incorrect because you want to use your leg muscles since they are well-developed and very strong. Question two, when lifting a stretcher using the power lift, you should A, bend at the hips, knees, back, and arms. C, bend at the waist and keep your back straight. C, place your hand palms on the litter handle. 
or D, place your hand palms down on the litter's sidebars. We talked about the power lift. So let's look at the correct answer. The answer is C. When lifting any heavy object, your hands should be facing palms up. This provides better lifting power and is not as stressful on the wrist. So let's look at the other answers. When lifting a stretcher using the power lift, you should A, bend at the hips, knees, back, and arms. Uh, when lifting, you want to keep your back and arms straight and always bend at the knees. So that answer is incorrect and incorrect here. B, bend at the waist and keep your back straight. That's incorrect because when lifting, you always want to keep your back straight. Never bend at the waist. C, place your pan, hands palm up on the litter handle. Again, that's the correct answer because it gives you the most power and strength. And D, place your hand palms down on the litter sidebar. And that's incorrect because we just discussed that palm up is the greater advantage in terms of strength and lifting power. Question three, it is impractical to apply a vest type extrication device on a critically injured patient to remove him or her from a wrecked vehicle because A, it takes too long to correctly apply, B, does not fully immobilize the spine, C, cannot be used on patients who are in their car, or D, does not provide adequate stabilization. So let's take a look at the correct answer. The correct answer is A. And it takes several minutes to correctly apply a vest type extrication device. This is too much time to waste when treating a critically injured patient. A long backboard would be more appropriate. Vest type immobilization devices, when applied correctly, provide adequate spinal stabilization and are ideal to, ideal to use in stable patients who need to be removed from their vehicle. But if somebody's critically ill, you just don't have the time. So again, we talked about this A is the correct answer because it takes too long to correctly apply if they're critically injured. B does not fully immobilize the spine. Um, when applied correctly, the vest provides adequate immobilization of the spine. But of course here, for a critically injured patient, you don't have time. C, it cannot be used on patients who are in their car. Sure it can. When a patient is stable, the vest is a beneficial device for vehicle extrication. But for a critically injured patient, again, you don't have the time. Or D does not provide adequate stabilization, but we already discussed that. The vest does provide adequate stabilization of the spine, but if your critically injured patient is critically injured, you don't have time to um, apply that. Number four, proper guidelines for correct reaching include all of the following except A, avoid twisting your back, B, avoid hyperextension of your back, C, keep the back in a locked in position, or D, reaching no more than 30 inches in front of your body. So let's look at the correct answer. It is D. When reaching, you should keep your back in a locked in position and avoid twisting or hyperextending your back. Do not reach more than 15 to 20 inches in front of your body. So we just went over all of the other answers and why they were incorrect. Uh, so I'm not going to review them here. But yes, avoid twisting your back, avoid hyperextension of your back, keep your back in a locked in position, that's correct, but you want to reach no more than 30 inches in front of your body, that's not correct, it's 15 to 20 inches. So proper guidelines for correct re reaching include all the following except D, because you don't want to reach that far in front of your body. Number five, an injured hang glider is trapped at the top of a large mountain and must be evacuated to the ground. The terrain is very rough and uneven. Which of the following devices would be the safest and most appropriate to use? A stair chair, a Stokes basket, a scoop stretcher, or a long backboard? Any of you emergency aficionados who watch through the years probably know the answer to this one. And it is B, a basket stretcher also called a Stokes basket or Stokes litter, should be used to carry patients over rough or uneven terrain that is inaccessible by ambulance. Its closed-ended sides protect the patient from falling out of the device, but the wire mesh helps provide water drainage if they happen to be trapped in water as well. So here the correct answer is B, the Stokes basket or Stokes litter. The stair chair is for stairs. 
not for taking a hang glider off the top of the mountain. And a scoop stretcher is not designed for this kind of terrain either. This is for a patient where you can have access to both sides of the patient and they're lying on a relatively flat surface. On a long backboard, in this situation, there would be no protection to keep the patient from rolling off of the device. Number six, when two EMTs are lifting a patient onto a long backboard, they should A, lift the patient from the sides of the board, B, make every attempt to lift with their backs, C, position the strongest EMT at the foot of the board, or D, position the strongest EMT at the head of the board. Let's take a look at the correct answer. It is D. Since more than half the patient's weight is distributed to the head end of the backboard or stretcher, you should always ensure that the strongest EMT is in that position. This will reduce the risk of injury to less strong personnel as well as the risk of dropping the patient. So let's look at these incorrect answers. A, lift the patient from the sides of the board. This may cause the backboard to tip since the upper torso is heavier. B, make every attempt to lift with their backs. Never lift with your back. Always use your legs. C, position the strongest EMT at the foot of the board. The strongest EMT should actually be at the patient's head where the patient's weight is greater. And that's why D is the correct answer. Question seven. Which of the following techniques is considered to be an emergency move? Extremity lift, supine transfer, firefighter's drag, or direct ground lift? And the correct answer is firefighter's drag. This is a one-person technique that is used when a patient must be removed from a life-threatening situation immediately. And if you recall, that's where you put your arm under the patient's armpits, cl close your arms over the top of their chest, and grasp your wrists and pull them to safety against your legs and, and body. So the extremity left is incorrect here because it's a non-urgent move, but it is helpful in narrow spaces. Supine transfer is not considered to be an emergency move. So the firefighter's drag is the correct answer. And a direct ground lift, that's a non-urgent move. It's used to carry a patient over long distances to a cot. Number eight, to extract a patient from the basement of a building, you must transport the patient up a flight of stairs. In doing this, you must ensure that the elevated head of the backboard goes first, the backboard with the elevated foot end goes first, the backboard is slightly tilted to the left to distribute weight, or the patient's feet are higher than his or her head, whichever end is carried first. So remember weight distribution and you'll probably get the right answer. This A, when you carry a patient upstairs or up an incline, you must ensure that the elevated head of the backboard or stretcher goes first. This will help to equally distribute the weight. So we just talked about why A is the correct answer. B, the backboard with the elevated foot end goes first. That's incorrect because you want to try to carry the head higher to distribute the weight, as we just discussed. C, the backboard is slightly tilted to the left to distribute weight. That's incorrect because backboards are designed to carry a patient flat, and the weight is best distributed when the head is slightly elevated. Backboards, you can't slightly elevate the head. And then the patient's feet are higher than his or her head, whichever end is carried first. That is incorrect because carries are easier with the patient's head first and elevated for distribution of the patient's weight. Question nine. If an injured patient needs to be moved but is not in immediate danger from fire or building collapse, you should first order the equipment you need for extrication, B, check the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation, C, remove the patient with the rapid extrication technique, or D, determine the number of people you will need to move the patient. The answer is B. The only time your attention should be directed away from the primary assessment of the patient is when the patient's life or your life is in immediate danger. So let's look at the incorrect answers. If an injured patient needs to be moved but is not in immediate danger from fire building collapse, you should first order the equipment you need for extrication. This is not the first thing you should do. B, check the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation. That's the correct answer. C, remove the patient with the rapid extrication technique. 
and that's unnecessary because the patient is not in immediate danger. Or D, determine the number of people you need to move the patient. This is incorrect because after the ABCs have been checked, the EMT can then determine the safest method of extrication. Always check the patient's ABCs first if the patient and scene are safe enough for you to do so. Number 10, the rapid extrication technique is a, a non-urgent non move to remove a patient from a vehicle, B, a technique used to transfer a patient from a bed to a stretcher, C, a technique used to lift a patient with no suspected spinal injury onto a stretcher, or D, a technique used to quickly remove a patient from a vehicle and onto a backboard. This one should be obvious. And it is D. With the rapid extrication technique, a seriously injured patient can be moved from a sitting position in a vehicle to a supine position on a backboard while protecting the spine at the same time. So let's look at the incorrect answers. A, a non-urgent move to remove a patient from a vehicle. Well, this technique is considered to be an urgent move. And in this situation, you need a rapid extrication. So a non-urgent move is not the correct thing. B, technique used to transfer a patient from a bed to a stretcher. That's incorrect because that's simply to move a patient from a vehicle to a backboard. C, the technique used to lift a patient with no suspected spinal injury onto a stretcher. This is not a lifting technique. The patient is placed on a backboard, not a stretcher. So the correct answer is the rapid extrication technique is a technique used to quickly remove a patient from a vehicle and onto a backboard. That's why that's the correct answer. Okay, class, I appreciate your attention. When you get to these skill sets, you need to make sure that you practice them and practice them and drill on them because each of them are different. Weight distribution is different depending on equipment. And you always want to make sure that you package the patient safely and you have adequate personnel to lift the patient and move them safely. So thank you again for your attention and I'll see you next class.